Okay, apologies. Uh, so we had we had to restart the the live stream because we noticed that uh, the video had jumped. So apologies. So we we'll just start again from the beginning. So as I was saying, um, last week you started looking at proteins. To, uh, that's tutorial sheet number five, which is on proteins, and you answered question one up to four with Ms. Chiposa, but you didn't complete question four. So today we'll take it up from question four and uh, move on from there. So I'm going to read the question again so that we can all follow. So the question reads, um, explain what is meant by primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, quaternary structures of proteins and relate every structural level to their function. Yes, so that's the question. And last week, you were able to look at uh, the primary structure and the secondary structure with Ms. Chiposa. And if you recall what you discussed, you said, um, she, yeah, you discussed that the primary structure simply refers to the unique or the precise um, arrangement or sequence of amino acids in a protein. And uh, you went on to discuss about, though, to discuss uh, the secondary structure, which is simply interaction of the backbone of the polypeptide. Uh, and you talked about two, two um, types of structures that exist under the secondary structure of amino acids. And those, these are um, the alpha helix, the alpha helix, and the beta pleated sheet. Beta pleated sheet. So in the alpha helix, we see an arrangement which is like a spring, like that. And uh, in the beta pleated sheet, you described two types of arrangement. It's either when you have two polypeptide chains running parallel to each other, so they can be either parallel to each other or antiparallel. So we have a parallel beta pleated sheet and an antiparallel beta pleated sheet. So we, we saw that um, the secondary level of uh, structure is basically be, uh, possible because of interaction of the backbone. So there's no interaction of the side chains here. So we see that the backbone will form hydrogen bonds with each, with each other. So it can be within the same molecule or with each other. So if you remember the general formula of an amino acid, which is Uh, the alpha carbon in the middle, which is connected to a, a side chain and a hydrogen, then we have a carboxyl group. Yes, so this is the basic formula of uh, an amino acid. Now, the hydrogen bonds are uh, interactions between uh, this oxygen of one amino acid with uh, a hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen, um, a hydrogen atom in an, uh, with, of another amino acid. So let's say we're at this point. If we expand this point, it's going to look. If we expand this point, it's going to look. Um, Okay, so let me just move the camera so that we see what we're talking about. So if we expand this point, it's going to look, uh, it's going to appear uh, like this. So let's say this is part of the polypeptide chain. Then we have our end there, which is connected to the alpha carbon, which has Okay, 
Okay, let me do it like this. So N is our H there, the alpha carbon H, and our side chain here, then um, our carbonyl carbon, then this is the rest of the polypeptide chain. So the hydrogen bond will form between this oxygen and a hydrogen of another polypeptide. So let's say okay, so our R group and our hydrogen. So the a hydrogen bond can form here and the hydrogen bond can form here. So the bond will be from the oxygen on the carbonyl group and uh, the hydrogen which is connected to the nitrogen atom. That's where the, hydro the hydrogen bonds are going to be formed. So remember, the hydrogen bonds we talk about at secondary level do not involve the side chains. So they only involve the backbone itself. So because of this interaction, we have two types of arrangement which are which can be either the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. Okay, so this was just a recap on what you did uh, last week. So today we are, we are going to discuss starting from the tertiary level. So this was the secondary level. So now at tertiary level, at tertiary level. At tertiary level, we see something a bit more complex. So at tertiary level, we, we are considering the three-dimensional structure of um, the, the polypeptide. So now, let's say this is a polypeptide chain. Okay. So polypeptide chains, um, when a protein is, has been synthesized, when the amino, amino acids have been put together, uh, for the protein to become functional, it has to assume a certain um, three-dimensional um, uh, three molecular structure, which is called globular, for it to become a functional protein. So uh, when it has been synthesized, it's just a straight chain of amino acids, then it will, be let, it will later be folded in a particular way for it to become a functional protein. So the tertiary structure is the folded structure, which is a functional protein of, a, uh, of it's a functional form of the protein of the amino acids. So now at tertiary level, we have different types of interactions. So the forces behind the tertiary level, uh, first of all, we talked about um, the hydrogen bonding, which, uh, which forms the beta pleated sheets or the, or the, the beta pleated sheets and the alpha helix. Okay, so our protein here can look like, yes, like that. So, in a tertiary structure, we can find, for example, here, we can have our hydrogen bonding here and here, similar to what we see in a beta pleated sheet. Then one portion can have a conformation of can have a conformation of a alpha an alpha helix. Then aside from the interactions that we know, in a tertiary structure. Apart from the interaction of the, the backbone between the backbone molecules, uh, between the backbone atoms, we also see interactions between the side chains. We see interactions between the side chains. So, for example, um, for example, if we have a side chain which is hydrophobic, you see that 
the side chains which would be hydrophobic would be concentrated on the inside of it will be concentrated on the inside of the protein away from the aqueous environment which has water in it so because of their hydrophobicity they will be concentrated on the inside of on the inside of the of the polypeptide chain then if we have for example ionic side chains or side chains that are charged or slightly charged they will be concentrated on the outside so now because of this uh, this globular protein is going to take up a particular shape uh, all these forces will act together to help stabilize that shape and uh, according to how the side chains are arranged it's going to have a particular function so that's the tertiary structure so remember in the tertiary structure we're just talking about one polypeptide chain which has been folded into a globular form so and in this folding is caused by hydrogen bonding hydrophobic interactions and uh, yeah so basically that's what uh, causes the the tertiary, the tertiary structure so now we also have the quaternary structure so in quaternary structure we see a combination of different uh, polypeptide chains remember in uh, tertiary we have just one polypeptide chain but in quaternary we have two or more polypeptide chains okay so quaternary so in quaternary okay let's say a good example is hemoglobin so if you remember well, hemoglobin uh, is found in red blood cells and its main job is to transport uh, to transport oxygen around the body so hemoglobin is a protein that has four amino acids two which are identical to each other so uh, yeah so we have our one globular protein here uh, which is identical to this one okay and another globular protein okay another globular protein so we know that hemoglobin carries a non-protein component which is known as heme so there will be a heme molecule there there and there and there okay so when you see uh, a protein that is made out of uh, two or more polypeptide chains this level of structure is referred to as quaternary this level of structure is referred to as quaternary and uh, yeah so that's basically the quaternary level of structure so we are done with this question then we can move on to the next question okay so the next question reads uh, discuss the different types of bonds present in proteins at each structural level so we discuss the type of bonds that are present at each structural level okay so if we remember the first structural level is primary right the primary structure so at the primary level at the primary level we if you remember we said primary level is simply the unique sequence of amino acid in a protein so here we're just considering how amino acids are bonded to each other and if you remember the bond which is between amino acids is simply a polypeptide bond right uh, a, a, a peptide bond sorry not polypeptide bond so we see peptide bonds peptide bonds so which are covalent in nature 
they are covalent, covalent bonds. So polypeptide bonds, yes. So that's the type of bonding we see in um, at the primary level. Yes. So when we go to secondary, secondary level of structure. Here, we discuss again the interaction between the backbones of the polypeptide chains. So here, the type of bonds we see here are hydrogen bonds. So simply, hydrogen bonds. Yes. So hydrogen bonds are the only thing, are the only types of bonds responsible for the secondary structure. So now, when you go to the tertiary structure, the tertiary structure, tertiary structure. So for the tertiary structure, first of all, we know that the individual amino acids are connected by peptide bonds which are covalent bonds. So here we see we have covalent bonds, covalent bonds. Then apart from covalent bonds, we also have hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. Then apart from that, we also said in tertiary structures, there is interaction of amino, uh, the side chains. So these side chains can also form bonds uh, at stationary level. So we have uh, ionic bonds, so which uh, usually referred to as salt bridges. Salt bridges. Salt bridges. Yes. Yeah, so these are the bonds that are formed uh, between side chains that are either uh, positively or negatively charged. So they interact with side chains that, are, uh, that have the opposite charge. So they form sort of bridges. So these include, they include dionic bonds, Ionic bonds. So actually, hydrogen bonds can also be referred to as salt bridges because uh, ionic, uh, uh, hydrogen bonds are possible because of the partial positive charges on uh, the hydrogen atoms and the partial uh, negative charge charges on on the on the oxygen atom. Okay. So those are the types of bonds that we find at tertiary structure. Then quaternary, at quaternary level, quaternary level, it's a combination of everything. Because quaternary level is just, we have uh, one or more, um, one or more um, polypeptide chains, together so all of them yes so under covalent bonds we know that uh, one important thing i forgot to mention so apart from the covalent bonds that are between um, uh, the uh, that are on the peptide bonds we also have covalent bonds between side chains for example uh, cysteine uh, can Covalently bond with another cysteine molecule to form what's known as a uh, disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds. So, which is a covalent bond. So, you should remember those. So, those are the types of bonding that we have at these levels. Okay. So, we are done with that question. So we can move on to the next question, uh, which is asking us to describe. So let me read the question. 
So the question reads, uh, describe the role of amino acids as buffers. Describe the role of amino acids as buffers. Okay. So we are now on question seven. And we want to describe the role of amino acids as buffers. So if you remember your chemistry or biology, a buffer is uh, a compound that resists the change in pH, right? And we know that pH is the potential of hydrogen. So the more, the more hydrogen atoms we have, the more acidic uh, that uh, substance is going to be, and the less, the more basic it's going to be. Okay, so now, let's say we have this amino acid, this amino acid, okay, this amino acid, okay, this uh, an amino acid, then you put it in an aqueous, uh, solution. So in that aqua solution, we have a lot of other things. Among them, we have hydrogen atoms which determine the pH. So imagine, okay, so with this amount of um, hydrogen atoms in this solution, the pH is uh, at 7, which is the neutral pH. So here, everything will be okay. So now let's say uh one more one more amino acid has been added to this solution so when one more amino acid has been added we we'll have more oh sorry sorry not amino acid sorry hydrogen atom so one more hydrogen atom has been added to this solution so which has changed the amount of hydrogen atoms in this solution making it uh, acidic making it acidic so how an amino acid works as a buffer when more hydrogen atoms have been added to the solution? So the nitrogen has the potential to take up one more hydrogen, removing it from the solution. And so it's going to take away this hydrogen from the solution and add it to itself. So this uh, hydrogen will in turn develop a positive charge. But by it removing this hydrogen from the solution, it will restore the balance which was there before, hence it has acted as a buffer. Hence it has acted as a buffer. So then let's say now we, yeah, we go back to our original state, our original state. Then this is the balanced amount of hydrogen atoms, uh, hydrogen atoms in that solution. Then, now, let's say one hydrogen has been taken away from this solution, which means it has thrown the entire solution out of balance because the number of hydrogen atoms is no longer the same, it has reduced, which means uh, the solution has become uh, basic. So what will happen? So to balance up uh, the potential of hydrogen, the amino acid will release one, will release this hydrogen atom from the carbonyl group. So leaving it charged, negatively charged, but releasing it to the surrounding solution, hence it will restore the balance of the hydrogen atoms, uh, restoring it to the normal pH. So this is how amino acids work as buffers in, this, in the system, uh, in biological systems. Yeah. Okay. So we can move on to the next question. So, 
Oh, sorry. I think I left out question six. I left out question six, sorry, sorry about that. Which read, um, question six read, describe the different types of proteins and list some of their functions. So question six was asking us to describe the different types of proteins and list their functions. Okay. So proteins have a lot of functions in the body. Proteins have a lot of functions in the body. So first of all, we have we have structural proteins. Structural proteins. So examples of structural proteins we have uh, um, collagen, collagen, which is the function collagen is found in connective tissue. So, so connective tissue. Uh, another example I can give is keratin. Keratin, which is found in structure like hair, structures like hair, your skin, etc. Okay, so structure, they contribute to the structure of uh, our different body parts. Then, apart from we also have proteins that um, we have storage protein. We have storage protein. Storage protein, uh, for example, uh, albumin. Albumin, which is found in eggs, right? So it says storage protein. Okay, so let's see. Storage protein. So, how do Okay. So, apart from storage protein, we have transport protein. So transport protein is an example is uh, something we've already looked at, hemoglobin, which we all know the function is to transport uh, oxygen uh, to different parts of the cells and to transport uh, carbon dioxide from different parts of the body to the lungs. So uh, hemoglobin. And apart from transport proteins, we have defense proteins. So defense, and defense proteins, we have um, uh, uh, antibodies. So antibodies, you have IgG, uh, I G A okay I G N I G N so immunoglobulin M immunoglobulin A and all that so those are some of the um some of the some of the defense proteins so you just have to remember antibodies are defense proteins. Then apart from antibody, uh, from these types of proteins, we also have um, we have um, hormonal proteins. So hormonal proteins. So hormonal proteins include uh, insulin. 
insulin. So you know the function of hormonal is to hormonal proteins is like all other hormones is to regulate a particular function uh, in the body. Yes. So apart from that, we have we also have what what are known as contractor proteins. Okay, contractor proteins. Contractor proteins. So contractor proteins include myosin and uh, actin. So these proteins are found in your muscles. So your muscles are able to contract because of uh, actin and myosin. Actin and myosin. So those are contractor proteins. Then uh, we also have what's known as uh, uh, enzymes. So enzymes are also proteins. So enzymes are also proteins. So an example of a protein enzyme is okay. You can say pepsin. Pepsin, oh. amylase, okay. amylase. Okay. So those are examples of um, examples of uh, enzymes, which are uh, proteins. Okay. So these are the different types of proteins that exist. So we have structural proteins which contribute to our structures, for example, collagen, which you find in tendons in your body, and um, yeah, and uh, cartilage. Then uh, keratin, which you find in your hair, your skin, uh, and your nails. Then, so proteins can be used for storage, uh, as storage of energy. So like in albumin, so we have albumin is a, storage protein then we have transport proteins transport proteins are like hemoglobin which uh, takes around uh, oxygen which takes oxygen around the body and uh, brings back uh, carbon dioxide back to the lungs then we have defense proteins which include um, antibodies so we have different types of antibodies which are all proteins and you know the function of antibodies is to defend us from invad invading microorganisms or any foreign substances. Mm -hmm. Then we have hormonal proteins, which are, you know that the hormone is a substance produced by glands in the body that has an effect on other organs. So insulin, for example, it regulates uh, uh, the amount of glucose in blood, right? Yeah. So. That's um, hormonal proteins. Then we have contractile proteins. So our muscles have special proteins that are designed to uh, produce the contraction uh, and relaxation uh, uh, motions. So depending, uh, so we have myosin and actin, how they interact. As you study further, you're going to understand how all these things work. Then uh, we have enzymes. So you know that enzymes are catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions in our bodies. So, uh, so proteins are, uh, some, some uh, proteins are enzymatic in nature. So these are the major groups of uh, proteins and how they, uh, and how they, then those are some of their functions. Okay, so now, we will go to the next question. We'll go to the next question, which reads, um, so we are now on question eight, which uh, says define enzyme activity and how an enzyme uh, affects activation energy. So define enzyme activity and how an enzyme affects activation energy. Okay. So we know 
that enzyme activity is simply okay, So enzyme activity is simply the measure of the catalytic ability of that enzyme. So it's measured in two ways. It can be described by the substrate concentration. You can monitor an enzyme activity by, uh, you can measure it by monitoring the substrate concentration in a given period of time. So for example, you have a substrate, you have your substrates, and you have your enzyme. Then uh, you mix them together, like the, uh, some of the experiments which you did, or I, I don't know if you did that lab where you had to measure. Okay, I think you didn't get the chance to do that lab. So yeah, so enzyme activity, you can either measure it by monitoring substrate concentration in a given period of time, or monitoring the concentration of that enzyme in uh, a period, in a given period of time. So now, the question also asks us to explain how enzyme, or how enzymes are, um, affect the activation energy of a reaction. So we know that activation energy of a reaction is the amount of energy that has to be put in to to be put into a reaction for it to happen. That's activation energy. So now, enzymes reduce activation energy, hence they uh, reduces the activation en energy, hence the reaction is going to happen faster than it was supposed to. So now, how do enzymes reduce activation energy? So when the enzyme binds to each substrate, it's going to bend the substrate in such a way that uh, the bonds between the atoms of that substrate are going to be weaker and it will take uh, very little energy for those bonds to be broken. Hence, the activation ed energy is going to be reduced. So I'll repeat that. So activation energy is going to be is reduced by enzymes uh, when they bind the substrate and they bend the substrate weakening the bonds between the atoms of the substrate. Hence, it's going to take very little energy to, to uh, break the bonds in, that, in the substrate. Hence, the chemical reaction is going to happen very fast. So that's how enzymes affect the activation energy. So now we'll go to the next question. Um, which is telling us to explain the induced fit model of enzyme action and the lock and key hypothesis and how they differ from one another. Okay, so if you remember from class, there are two hypotheses that are used to explain the enzyme activity. So the first one is the lock and key the lock, lock and key, and key, the lock and key. So this hypothesis uh, was uh, proposed by Emil Fischer in 19, sorry, in 1894. So Emil Fischer, so Emil Fischer, he was a chemist in, and he proposed this hypothesis in 1894. So he says an enzyme, so we know that an enzyme has what's known as an active site. active site which has a particular shape so so when you introduce so they say each enzyme an enzyme that ca ca catalyzes a particular uh, reaction will interact with a substrate that has 
the exact shape of its active site. So in this case, this is our substrate. Substrate. So the, the, this is the enzyme. Enzyme. Sub, uh, uh, our enzyme has an active site which has the exact shape uh, of the substrate. Enzyme. Yes, and these are going to interact after interaction. We are going to have our enzyme will remain unchanged. So our enzyme will remain unchanged, but our substrate is going to be is going is going uh, to be uh, we are going to have our products from our substrate. So for example, maybe two products. So enzyme then. Okay, so now in the lock and key hypothesis, Emil Fischer described the enzyme's active site being exactly uh, having the exact same shape which complements the substrate the way every door, uh, every lock has a complementary key. So that's why we call it lock and key. So in this case, our uh, active side to be like our lock, then our substrate to be like our key, to be like our key. So in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in this uh, hypothesis, Emil Fischer uh, suggested that each enzyme has a specific shape that will only work for a particular substrate which has a complementary shape. So that's where the lock and key comes from. So that's our lock and key hypothesis. So now, the other hypothesis is the induced fit hypothesis, which was proposed by uh, Mr. Koshland in 1959. So that's the lock and key. So, Almost 60 years later, or maybe 70 years later, 60 years later, in 1959, Koshland, another brilliant scientist, proposed another mechanism uh, which is known as the induced fit. Induced fit model. Okay, so now in the induced fit model, uh, Mr. Koshland proposed an hypothesis that when we have an enzyme, an enzyme there, which has our active site there. When you introduce a substrate, let's say our substrate is okay. our substrate is shaped like this. Our substrate. What is going to happen is the shape, the shape of our active site is going to change to fit the shape of our of our substrate. Okay, it's going to have the, the shape of the active site is going to conform to the shape of our substrate. Hence, uh, we're going to have, we're going to have, after the reaction that happened, we're going to have our enzyme which will be unchanged from the original shape plus our product. Okay. Yes, so product. And 
okay. So this is the induced fit model. So it's called the induced fit because the active site of the enzyme is going to conform its shape to accommodate the shape of the, the, the substrate. Hence, it's known as the induced fit model. Okay, so the difference is, the difference from the, from the lock and key uh, hypothesis is, in the lock and key hypothesis, the shape of the active site of the enzyme is always the same. But in the induced fit, we see that it changes to accommodate the shape of the substrate. Okay, so that's the difference between the induced fit and the lock and key models. Okay. Okay, so we move on. We move on to the next question. Uh, uh, question 10, which, uh, let me read it, which says, explain how the following affects enzymatic activity. So, explain how the following explain, um, affect enzymatic activity. So the first thing that we have been asked to explain how temperature temperature affects enzymatic activity. Okay, so first of all, one thing you have to know is um, enzymes have a particular range of temperature in which they work best, so which is known as their optimum temperature. So for example, for enzymes in a human body, their optimum temperature, their optimum temperature is between uh, 35 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we are using uh, enzymes in a human body as a reference point to see how temperature affects enzyme activity. So now, this, this is the, the, the temperature at which the enzymes work best. So what happens if you reduce the, if you reduce the temperature below this optimum temperature. So if you reduce below 35 degrees, as you go lower, the lower the temperature, the slower the enzymatic activity. So the uh, enzyme activity will reduce as the temperature reduces. And you eventually, if the temp you keep reducing the temperature, eventually the temperature will reduce completely and there will be no uh, enzymatic activity. So remember, temperature. What temperature does to any molecule? So temperature increases the uh, when you're taking out temperature, you're reducing the kinetic energy. So as you reduce the kinetic energy, there will be less interaction or collision between the molecules. Hence, they won't interact and produce a chemical reaction. So that's one reason why reduction of temperature re uh, reduces enzymatic activity. Now, what happens if you increase the temperature above the optimum? So proteins, uh, as you increase the temperature of proteins above the optimum, uh, you'll find that the molecular integrity of the proteins will be compromised. The uh, arrangement of the pro remember proteins are folded in a particular way, and according to how they are folded to form globular proteins, they're going to have a specific function. But as you um, increase the temperature, the proteins are going to lose um, their shape, their three-dimensional uh, conformation, because the molecules will start falling apart as the temperature is increasing. So the higher the temperature, the slower the, the, the so if you are going above the optimum range, the higher the temperature, the slower the reaction will be until eventually when the temperature is too high, the shape of the protein is going to be destroyed, which is known as denaturization. So the shape will be denatured, hence it will no longer be functional. So eventually if you continue rising the temperature, the enzyme won't be functional, hence there will be no enzymatic activity. So 
That's how uh, temperature affects enzyme activity. Okay. Then um, the other thing we have been asked is how it's how how pH affects how pH affects uh, how pH affects uh, enzyme activity. So again here pH we know is the potential of hydrogen which measures the alkalinity or the acidity of a, a solution. So we know that also enzymes have an optimum pH which in most biological uh, form, uh, in most biological uh, systems the optimum pH is around 7, uh, a pH of 7. So again here if the more we go out of the optimum pH, the lesser the enzyme activity. Go, uh, because also uh, denaturization will also occur when the environment is too acidic or too basic. The enzyme is going to lose its three-dimensional shape, which, uh, which means it's also going to lose its functionality. So because of uh, going out of the optimum. So whether you go up too, too high, of, of the optimum or too low from the optimum, the enzymatic activity will reduce. Okay. Then we are also being asked to talk about how inhibitors affect um, affect enzymatic activity. So even from the way, an inhibitor is something that stops something. So if there's presence of inhibitors, uh, if it's just in a small amount, it's going to slow down the process. But if it's in a large amount, then the process is going, uh, the enzymatic uh, process is going to be stopped completely. So that's how inhibitors affect uh, enzyme activity. Then um, we also have a uh, how substrate and enzyme concentration affect. So, if we have a lot of substrates and very few enzymes, the reaction, okay, so let's say if we have substrate and enzyme in equal amounts, if we have uh, that arrangement, the reaction is going to happen very fast because each substrate will have a, an enzyme to interact, to speed up its, uh, its uh, reaction. So now, if we have more substrate than the enzyme present, the, 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 the reaction will not be as quick as when they were in equal amounts. Then also, if we have too much enzyme, if we have too much enzyme but very few substrate, also this one will also be fast because each substrate will have a lot of, um, a lot of enzymes to interact with which will speed up the reactions. So the only time it will be slow is when we have more substrate compared to the enzyme. That's when it's going to be slow. But when they're in equal proportions or when the enzyme is more than the substrate, the reaction is going to be very fast. So that's how substrate and enzyme concentration affects an, enz an enzymatic reaction. Okay, then um, D says, uh, okay, so we are done with that question. Then question 11 is asking us to state the different types of enzyme inhibitors. The different types of enzyme inhibitors. Okay, so as I said earlier, an inhibitor is, uh, an enzyme inhibitor is something that uh, stops enzyme, enzymatic uh, activity, enzyme activity in short. So uh, with enzymes, we have two major types of inhibitors. We have um, we have uh, competitive inhibitors. Inhibitors. And we also have the non-competitive inhibitors.
Okay, so now what's the difference between the competitive and the non-competitive inhibitors? So for competitive inhibitors, so now we are talking about competitive inhibitors. So for competitive inhibitors, remember, if you remember, we said an enzyme has an active site which has a complementary shape to the substrate. So let's say this is a substrate. Then, for competitive inhibitors, competitive inhibitors will have, so this is our substrate, substrate, this is our enzyme. Okay, so, for competitive inhibitors, they are going to have the exact shape of the substrate. So, so they are called competitive inhibitors because they will compete with the substrate for the active site. They will compete with the substrate for the active site. Active site. So you find the inhibitors who bind to the active site of the sub of the enzyme ends. The substrate will not be able to interact with the enzyme ends. The enzymatic activity will not take place. So though these are competitive inhibitors. Then we have non-competitive inhibitors. So for the non-competitive, for the non-competitive inhibitors, uh, they do not have the same shape with the active site, with the active site or the substrate. So for the non-competitive inhibitors, for example, if we have a protein there. And our, our substrate. Oh, sorry, I missed the wrong card. Also, we have our enzyme. Then we have our substrate. Substrate there. Um, yes. Um, so now the non-competitive inhibitor will won't have the same shape with the substrate. So it will have just another different shape. Yes. So now. A uh, competitive inhibitor is going to interact with, uh, with the enzyme at an allosteric site. So it can it will come and bind on the allosteric site. And once it does that, it's going to change the shape. It's going to change the shape of the active site. So the active site we change we change the shape for example a shape which can no longer accommodate the substrate and by doing that it's it inhibits it inhibits uh, the enzymatic reaction from going forward because the active site cannot accommodate the enzyme so that's how uh, non-competitive inhibitors uh, function okay so we are left with uh, two more questions so uh, question 12 we now go to question 12 which reads 
what is meant by enzyme denaturation and deactivation? So I think we already talked about this when we are looking at the effect of temperature and the effect of pH and all these other factors that affect enzyme activity. So denaturation is the loss of the shape of the end of the enzyme. So it's special shape which gives it its function its globular conformation when it has been changed due to temperature or maybe chemicals which are acidic or alkaline we refer to it as it has been denatured hence it will not be a functional protein then the activation uh, refers to uh, when a, an enzyme has been rendered useless or it's no longer functional uh, for example due to reduction in temperature, you can say that enzyme has been deactivated, it has, go, it has undergone deactivation because it's not functional. So denaturation also can bring about enzyme deactivation. So that's what those two terms mean. Then the last question for today, uh, which is what are the major roles of enzymes in living systems? What are the major roles of enzymes in living systems? So we know that human beings are alive because uh, we have different chemical reactions going on in our body. So we are basically alive. Okay, so chemical reactions on their own that, uh, and, uh, that go in our, our bodies would have been very, 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 very slow without enzymes. We know that enzymes speed up this reaction. So without enzymes, like literally no body function can go on. Like this goes down to even molecular level, just the replication of DNA, the translation, the translation of uh, RNA, everything, uh, the transcription, Everything requires specific enzymes. So without these enzymes, these processes would have been taking years. Just imagine it would have been taking years to uh, transcribe a, 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 a DNA molecule into RNA. Then imagine if you choose to take that long, how would life be? So the roles of enzymes in our system are very critical in biological system. Without them, life wouldn't be as we know it. It would have been very slow. So on that note, we are going to conclude today's uh, tutorial. If you have any questions, you can contact any of the biology tutors for any clarifications. So thank you very much for your time today.